Consumption by S. C. Mendez You've been cordially invited. Rachel read the cursive script on front, then opened the card. Oh my God! Her words fell to a whisper as her eyes reread the few lines of text over and over, not daring to believe. Without looking up, she shouted, Babe? No answer. Rachel could hear computer keys clicking under his fingers, and yet she'd fallen so deep into the spell of the invitation, the sound seemed far away. It's real, she whispered. The need to share pulled her gaze from the card and she walked to Patrick's desk. Guess what? Just a second. He put up a hand and pecked at the keyboard with the other. There, done. What's up? Rachel held up the card. Do you know where I've just been invited? Food Wish Podcast? Please, this is a hundred times better. She opened the card, grinning. Cobzo! Cobzo? Patrick's smile dropped. The hell is Cobzo? Are you serious? Cobzo, the greatest food event in the world! Still, his face was blank. Part of her was angry. The other part was crushed. Do you know anything about our industry? He's only here for one thing. In the past year, I've tried to book you on every food event and channel, and I never heard of no Cobzo. It's not like that. Rachel sat down on the couch and looked across the tiny apartment to his computer chair. You can't ask to attend the Cobzo. Invites are only given to the most esteemed gastronomes. To receive one is like winning the lottery. You got my attention. What exactly is this Cobzo? No one knows for sure, except for attendees. Rachel glided her fingertips over the card. Rumors call it the most elusive and exclusive gathering of gourmets. It's held every four years at a secret location. The most exotic and dangerous foods in the world. Dangerous? Pufferfish? Kesu Martsu? Anything goes from what I've heard. She flushed and her mouth salivated. They serve dishes most foodies could only dream of consuming. So, foods that are illegal in America? Patrick swiveled his chair back to the screen, typed into the search bar, then started reading. I don't know about this, babe. What's the address? It's here in New Mexico. But I doubt that's where the cabzo is being held. It's probably just where we meet. Then all guests will be rerouted two or three more times before we get to the actual event. His laughter stung. You really believe this covert bullshit? He scrolled through the search engine. It's a setup. You're hot, the star of food porn, and this is some fanboy pulling your leg, hoping you'll show up on his doorstep. How does some fanboy find our address? They got nothing to do but stalk celebrities and beat off. He pointed at the screen. Tons of sites saying there's no such thing as the cabzo. You think I don't know that? Think I haven't read about it a million times? But there's just as many websites claiming it is real. Babe. Patrick swiveled back to look at her. We need to be focused on building the channel, creating content, and engaging with your fans. Moves that make money. If this is a prank, which it probably is, we can't waste time on it. Rachel looked back at the card. The euphoric wave subsided to a small trickle. Maybe he was right. Was she so blinded by excitement that she didn't see the prank? Speaking of time being money, he said, I cannot get this website updated with the new forum features. Text Tubby, would you? This is what I'm paying him for. You mean Tyler? You know who I mean. Would it kill you to be nice 
Without him, we wouldn't have a food porn. Relax. Patrick stood up and went to the kitchen. I don't say it to his face. He grabbed a beer from the fridge and popped it open. Wonder what you say about me when I'm not around. She folded her legs under her on the couch, crossing her arms, staring off at the wall. Fine, he said. Would you please text Tyler and get him to update the forum? I told you earlier I'm going to his place tomorrow to discuss new ideas. I'll tell him then. We kind of need it updated ASAP. Fine. She picked up her phone and messaged. Patrick took a swig of beer. You want to go to O'Kelly's and catch the Laker game? No, thanks, she said. I'm tired. Fine. I'm going to watch it here, then. Patrick sat down on the couch and turned on the TV. They were only one cushion apart, and yet she'd never felt further away. The Cabzo tie. Can you believe it? When she gripped his shoulders, Tyler felt the tingles penetrate every layer of his body. It's a foodie's wet dream, he agreed. But are you sure it's real? Don't you start with that, too. She sank away from him. I'm sorry, girl. I don't mean it like that. It's just so wild to believe it's real. I always figured it was the greatest urban legend in the community. Nobody who's been ever talks. Everyone just knows someone who knows someone. Tyler understood her passion for the life, but her face seemed more crushed by his admission than it needed to be. Okay, what's really wrong? She sighed. What did he do? Just being his regular assholey self. Tyler never liked to discuss Patrick if it could be avoided. It was torture knowing that tool got to enjoy Rachel. But when she vented her frustrations, a small part of Tyler rejoiced and hoped they'd break up. Not that he'd ever have a chance with someone like her, but it was nice to dream. He doesn't think it's real? Of course not, but it's more than that. It's his total discounting of my feelings. Wouldn't even discuss... He forgets the whole point of why we started the food porn show. It's just a business for him. She mocked Patrick's voice. I should be filming and engaging with fans and growing the channel. A slight tremor took hold of her, and Tyler reached across the coffee table, taking her slender hands in his pudgy paws. Only when she was in distress could Tyler risk a caring touch or pushing his agenda. He ignored the smooth warmth of her skin. It's okay, he said. Maybe, maybe it's time you think about splitting ways with him. Coming here, upset, it's not exactly a rare occurrence. I'm sorry to keep doing this to you. Don't be, it's him. You even said it. He's more consumed with the money than the lifestyle. I shouldn't say that. He's not all bad. He's the reason the show's a success. You're the reason it's a success. I don't see him cooking in lingerie or eating in sexy outfits. Anyone can run things behind the scenes. I mean, hey, I'm not too shabby of a webmaster, am I? You're the best, she smiled. And I couldn't do it without you either. But if Patrick just had that curiosity, that true love of food... He'd see how getting an invitation to the Cobzo could make us the most famous website in the industry. If it is real, they're not going to let you report on it. I don't need to report on it. I just... I just need to know. To be a part of it. It's a foodie's Mount Everest. My moment of arrival. I've been chosen, and I can't believe you're siding with him. The last glow of excitement extinguished from her eyes. I'm not siding with him. I'm asking you to look at this logically. Patrick is not passionate like us. He's consumed with the business. But maybe, just perhaps, you're too consumed by something else 
to see the truth about the Kabzo. You don't think it's real either? I honestly can't say. But the stories? The invitation is for you alone. You'd have no one you trust along. There are no cameras allowed. It's more than likely in another country. Rumors have compared it to underground cockfighting rings. Dirty vendors in a wet market selling... I've also heard it described as the most extravagant of galas. That's why it's a legend. No one knows. But I can. She held up the card. Knowing can't possibly be worth the risk, can it? She looked away from him, and Tyler knew her answer. She pulled her hands from his. I thought you of all people would understand would support me going. Tyler tried to keep the anguish from his face. He wanted to satisfy her hunger for knowledge. He understood why she never felt satiated for long, why she thought the Cobzo would end the cravings. He had similar reasons for eating. They were kindred souls. The difference was the weight never showed on her. She was gorgeous on the outside, no matter how much she consumed. But on the inside, Rachel wanted to be full, no matter what the cost. Please, for me, Rachel, don't go. Around 4 p.m. the next day, someone pounded on his apartment door. It was so loud, Tyler half expected to hear the police announce themselves. He inched up to the peephole and looked out at the face of Patrick. I know you're in there. Patrick called. I need to talk with you. Tyler checked that the chain lock was secure and opened the door. What's up, Patrick? Patrick got right up to the small opening. Is Rachel in there with you? No. You lying, Tubby? What's your problem? No, I'm not lying. Last I saw her was yesterday. What time did she leave? Tyler shrugged. About this time, maybe 4.15? Did she not come home? Patrick pulled back from the crack. Damn! He turned and paced around the hall. Where the fuck could she be? He approached again. Would you open the door so we can talk? You gonna be pissed and call me names? No. <sighs> Fine. Tyler closed the door and removed the chain. When he opened it back up, Patrick looked calmer. Come in. Did she tell you about this kakaba, that stupid food contest thingy? She told me about it. And? Patrick's voice raised. And I told her she shouldn't go. She was annoyed and left shortly after. We didn't even get the next week's episode fleshed out. Great. Patrick slumped back on the couch. Let's start calling her friends. Maybe we can post something on her platforms as the admin, saying she went missing and ask if anyone's... What the fuck are you talking about? We can't do that. We can't say anything. We've filmed two shows ahead, which means we have content for two more weeks. We can find her by then. No one needs to know. Aren't you worried? I'm not worried about her. I'm pissed off at her. Big difference. Patrick leaned forward. Nothing's wrong. She's got her panties in a bunch because we didn't agree with her idea. Probably realized by now how stupid it was and wants to pout on her own. When she's tired, she'll come home. What if you're wrong? Tyler paused and the worst-case scenarios pushed into his awareness. What if she went to the Cobzo? Patrick opened his mouth, then paused. He shook his head. I doubt it. But Tyler could see he didn't completely doubt it. Was there a date or time on the invitation she received? No, it was just the invitation with an address. Do you remember the address? It doesn't matter. Patrick was up on his feet now. It was on Monroe Street, somewhere just west of Roosevelt. 
but it doesn't matter. I'm telling you, she didn't go. He moved to the window and stared outside. Tyler knew better than to say anything else. Patrick turned back to him. I'm going to get out of here. If you hear from her, give me a call. Tyler nodded. Monroe Street, just west of Roosevelt. After two days without a word from Rachel, Tyler caught an Uber downtown. It was a bustling area with hipster restaurants and breweries, mixed with posh eateries and a park square that often had farmer's markets and small music sets. Any number of addresses could have been on that invitation, but if Tyler could only pick one to help, it would be Madame Hawthorne's. It took 30 minutes before Tyler was even admitted to the upstairs loft. He was padded down twice before he was escorted into her studio apartment above the swanky restaurant. The room was dim and cool. Madame Hawthorne was lounging on an oversized chaise surrounded by trays of varying heights all within reach. She reminded him of a beautiful Jabba the Hutt. Tyler, Tyler, oh, it's been so long. Finally ready for something exotic for that little show of yours? She licked her plump red lips. Not exactly. Oh, she said, though her face didn't seem surprised at his cover story to see her. Whatever could you want, then? You obviously know Rachel from the show? Quite the dish, she is. I bet viewers could just eat her up. Has she... has she visited you these last few days? At that moment, standing between two bodyguards, it would have been less scary talking to a pissed-off Patrick. Now why would you think she'd come to visit me? Hawthorne smirked, and Tyler forgot what a sicko this woman was. She got off on watching him squirm. She got an invitation for the Cobzo. It sent her to an address in the square. If anyone is knowledgeable on the event, it would be you. She laughed and reached for a glass of red wine with her right hand. Her left moved to a cheese, meat, and olive tray. Pecorino, my favorite pairing with Merlot. She bit, then swallowed. Eyes closing, full cheeks flushing with euphoria. Care for a bite? No, thank you. Watching her eat was not appetizing. I'm worried about her. Is there anything you can tell me? About what? Hawthorne licked a finger. The Cobzo. Is it real? Is it here in the square? Maybe she's attending or maybe she just went missing. She didn't tell me or her boyfriend. The corpulent madame drained more wine, then returned the glass. I wouldn't worry about Rachel. She's a big girl. She can handle herself. What you need to be focusing on is you. She formed her fingers into a rectangle in front of her eye, framing him within. You should start your own channel. Or better yet... I could use someone with your talents. If you don't want to help me, that's fine. But I already have a job at food porn. I love that name, by the way. It's so poetic. She closed her eyes and inhaled. Food and sex. The only things that matter in this world. Her eyes snapped open, and Tyler saw wild passion, same as in Rachel. It's true when you think about it. What else is there? Everything a human does is to improve the quality of their food and sex. People say it's money and power we crave, but it's not. The only reason for money and power is to achieve more appealing food and more exotic sex. To live is to eat and screw. Wouldn't you agree? Please, tell me what you told Rachel. I just want to find her. Ugh, begging is such a turn-off. Do you ever think that maybe the young lady was testing you and the boyfriend? Perhaps you failed. 
Perhaps she wanted to get away from you. Tyler couldn't believe that, but the mere mention stole his voice. He replayed her face, her words. Was he missing something? So there is no Cobzo? I'm fascinated by your obsession with this woman. Hawthor took a crystal glass of water and cleansed her palate, then eyed the various trays, settling on a bowl of salted nuts. If there was a Cobzo, you would find it by asking for Uke Mach at Ling Ling's market. Tyler pulled out his phone and began typing in the name. Where is... It's in L.A. That's where Rachel went? If she's searching for the Cobzo, that's where she went. Forget her, though. Tonight's meal is shark fin soup. You should stay. I can't forget her. Madam Hawthor gave a sigh and a pout. What a pity. It was an excruciating 36 hours, waiting for the next flight from New Mexico to LAX. Once he landed, he rented a car and detoured to a hotel, only long enough to drop off his single piece of luggage. Then, he hopped on the bus to the downtown district and Ling Ling's market. From there, he was bounced across town from a classy restaurant to outdoor stalls. When he finally got an address in the secluded hills of Napa Valley, Tyler was exhausted and returned to the hotel for a nap. He woke, hours later, to a dark room and a ringing phone. He fumbled for the cell in the bedsheets. Hello? You trying to screw me? Patrick? You're with her, aren't you? He screamed. Played dumb, then ran off and screwed me. Well, it doesn't work like that. I don't know what you're talking about. B.S. All the passwords are changed. You locked me the hell out. You can keep yelling at me, but I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I've been to your place. I know you ain't there. I know you're with her. And if... Tyler hung up and pushed off the covers. He switched on the bedroom lamp and grabbed his laptop. He opened a new window and logged on to Food Porn's administer dashboards. Email or password error. You have three more attempts. No, no, no. He tried again, hitting each key with precision. Email or password error. You have two more attempts. Tyler ran a clammy hand through his hair. He could see her on the couch, her eyes begging him to be excited about the invitation. Perhaps it was a test. Maybe she wanted to get away from you. Tyler felt dizzy. Tyler closed the laptop and lay back on the bed. Scenario after scenario forced its way into his mind. Nothing stuck. Nothing made sense. He pulled out the address in Napa. Every person he'd contacted gave him the same song and dance as Madame Hawthor, eventually throwing him a crumb that only led to more questions. No one ever acknowledged that the Cobzo was real, but neither did they tell him it wasn't. It was like one big game to mess with him. And now he was locked out of the website. Forget her. Forget the Cobzo. The whole thing was a waste. All his time, all his money. What would be at the address? More questions? Patrick thought Tyler was in on Rachel's disappearance, but he didn't have a clue. I should be in on it. We're friends. Why wouldn't she tell me? It was a test. I failed. If I had told her to go to the Cobzo, she would have counted me as an ally and revealed this covert plan to leave. Tyler looked at the address again. There was nothing else to lose. He rolled down the window and pressed the intercom button outside the gate. The lines repeated in his head. He swallowed. No answer. While he was contemplating a second press of the button, the speaker box came to life. Welcome to Nassau Farms. Do you have an appointment? Hi. No. I... 
I, I was referred by a business associate. I'd very much like to take a tour, discuss purchases. I'm on my way out of town, but I couldn't resist. Is a tour available? The well-practiced speech sounded foolish now. The speaker box was silent. Hello? There was a buzz, and the iron gate rattled. Splitting down the middle, the bars separated, allowing him access. Welcome, sir. I am Isaiah Hirsch, one of the caretakers. The man had gray hair under his square black hat. His body was clothed in a long black coat, buttoned down the front, obscuring all of his body but his hands. Tyler Laredo, they shook. Sorry for my casual dress. Travel day. Tyler issued a nervous chuckle. As I said, when my associate knew I was so close to your estate, he told me I had to visit before leaving California. A soft smile creased his darkly tanned features. Of course. A tour and a tasting, yes? Yes, please. Tyler received a glass of red wine, Isaiah informing him there was only one house wine. Then they walked the outskirts of the fields. They passed beautiful, expansive gardens, not just of grapes, but various fruits and vegetables. Workers dressed in similar attire to Isaiah tilled the fields. For a hundred years, Nassau has been here, crafting artisan food. It is more than a winery, more than a food company. It is a way of life, and everyone who works here is a family. Tyler nodded and took a sip of wine. It reminded him of an Amish community. Everyone working in some capacity for the whole. Only when these workers retired, they did so in the mansion that Isaiah was leading them back to. It looked like a castle or British boarding school from a bygone era. They were only a couple yards from the doors, and Tyler knew he had to pull the trigger. Forgive me, Isaiah, he said, but I'm afraid there's a bit more to my arrival today. Oh, the man slowed. This is going to sound silly, but I think my friend may have visited here recently. He pulled out his phone. Here's a picture of her. Did she happen to come by it at all? Isaiah's eyes narrowed a bit, but he didn't seem alarmed by Tyler's farce. He looked at the phone. Yes. She did? His pulse began to race. Do you know where she is now? She came to us, much like you have, and was confused about food. Her palate needed re-education. Rachel confused about food? He chuckled. Obviously, you haven't seen food porn. Food porn? Now the man's face seemed to darken with disappointment. Tyler choked on his last sip of wine. Sorry, it's a, um, a cooking show. It's, it's not real pornography. Rachel, her name's Rachel Givings. She's very knowledgeable about food. The man nodded. Most people think they're knowledgeable on the subject of food. Yet most have lost touch with the reality of the importance of what one ingests. Isaiah stopped about 50 yards from the mansion doors. Eating is a very spiritual and intimate experience. Did you not taste the power in the wine? Tyler looked down at the glass. Oh, yes, it, uh, it was amazing. About Rachel, our ancestors put all of their efforts into meal preparation. The entire community toiling day after day just for that brief moment when the life-giving force of God would touch their lips. Isaiah's eyes saddened. 
Mankind has lost that reverence. They eat for pleasure now, a mass-producing business, consumption without meaning. Nassau Farms will change that. Isaiah continued to the doors. The confusing conversation, heat, and wine churned in Taylor's mind, tiring him despite his mission. It's important that you tell me when she left. She's been... missing... Tyler felt stupid. The words wouldn't come. How was he so drunk off one glass? Isaiah opened the door, ushering him inside. I need... I need... Tyler's throat felt dry, and his head swayed. Is this the Cobzo? Is this real? Where's... Where's Rachel? He heard the wine glass shatter. His body fell too, but Tyler caught himself on the door handle. He could feel hands around him, lowering him slowly to the floor. The tile felt cool against his warm cheeks. Eyes straining to focus, he saw Isaiah bend forward. Cobzo is real, but it is not what you think it is. Then... The image faded to black. Tyler shoveled food into his mouth. Every delicacy he could ever want, all of it. A gorgeous presentation before a mirrored table, polished to perfection. Each bite was disgusting, though. Tender fruit skin broke, flooding his mouth with rancid juices. Meat was sour and chewy, Maggots writhed in pies. Voices infiltrated the hellish banquet of his nightmare. Eventually, the meal was replaced by a dark room. The only illumination came from candles which lined the walls. In their flickering glow, men chanted. They were the men from the fields. Head to toe in black, they rocked back and forth. Their deep voices were all he could hear. Tyler could not decipher if they were actual words or mere sounds. The chanted tones resonated in his body, and it was oddly soothing. Though his body relaxed, the fear in his mind did not subside. As more of his senses awakened, Tyler could see that he was upright but not standing. His body was leaning forward at a slight angle, perhaps 40 degrees. He was held in place somehow. He tried to move his head, but found resistance. He looked down and saw he was naked, a white porcelain basin underneath his body. Oh God, what are you doing to me? His voice was weak against their chanting. A figure broke from the ranks and placed his hands on the side of Tyler's head. He spoke in a language Tyler did not understand. Then he blew into Tyler's mouth. The sensation repulsed him, and Tyler felt his body convulse. Vomit spewed into the basin, and Tyler fell back into unconsciousness. When Tyler awoke again, Isaiah was standing before him. The men and candles were gone. Light entered from a large window. Why? Why are you doing this? Tyler's voice was weak. Isaiah brought a glass of water before his face, placed a handkerchief under his chin, and tilted the glass. Tyler swallowed until he coughed, and Isaiah withdrew the cup. The liquid soothed his dehydrated throat. Tyler still felt the straps around his head and arms, but could not see what he was bound to, keeping him at a slanted angle, though it felt hard like a board against his back. I'm sorry I lied, okay? I'm not a restaurant investor at all. I just wanted to find her. Tyler's body hitched against the straps that held him. I needed to know if the Cobzo was real or if she'd ditched me. I'm sorry. 
The tears fell, collecting in the trough below. There is no real Kabzo, only our holy order. It is doubtful that whoever gave you this address knows quite who we are. The legend of Kabzo has taken on a life of its own, though, and the mystery serves us well. What are you doing to me? Curing you. Isaiah walked over to the window. Civilization has grown sick, mentally and physically, and no one realizes it. People like you and Rachel, though, are the most disturbed, fully consumed. You are the ones who stop at nothing to find Kabzo. When you reach us, our mission is to help you. By doing so, we will heal all of humanity. Tyler tried to calm his breathing. Isaiah turned back to him. Do you know why it is unwise to eat pork? Tyler remained silent, saving strength, opting to let the man talk. Thousands of years ago, rules on what one could and could not eat were always dictated by God to man. Rules that today's men of science scoff at as superstition. And yet those men of science are slowly discovering what our ancestors knew all along. One being the avoidance of swine. Eating pig is like eating man. Pigs are even referred to as horizontal men. Did you know that? Tyler could feel hysterics threatening again. What are you talking about? What do you want from me? To elevate your divine soul. Isaiah smiled and returned with the water cup. Tyler was not too proud to drink again. When he was done, Isaiah put the cup down and continued. Pigs mimic men in many ways. It's why doctors use pig organs in transplants and for growing cells. Eating flesh of a living creature can cause all types of maladies in the body, especially when the DNA is similar to our own. Kuru, if it is human flesh, and much worse maladies can besiege one when proper eating is not observed. Tyler took deep breaths through his nose and out his mouth. Please, I'm trying to understand. I really am, but I don't get it. Everything in the universe has a divine essence. The expression of that divine spark depends on the vessel it is encapsulated in. As humans, we are in the unique position to eat in a manner which elevates the divine sparks of our food, taking less aware organisms and raising them up along with ourselves into high realms of consciousness. The life force travels from soil to plant, searching ever upward for a human to ingest that essence into themselves, then burning the divine calories by doing acts of goodness in the world. Doing good? You think this is good? Look at me! We fuel our bodies to carry out service to God. Eating is the most intimate form of union with the universe one can ever have. We are restoring that sacred act. Now, do you understand? Do you see what humans have done to the most sacred of acts? You're fucking crazy! The words shot so violently from him that a bolt of pain seared into his throat. The brothers of our order are not crazy. We are not the ones putting our food through slaughterhouses where the fear remains trapped in the blood, the flesh. He approached Tyler and slid two fingers across his tear-soaked face, rubbing them before Tyler's eyes. No, we do not eat for fun. We do not overeat and lie to ourselves that we need this many calories. We do not value taste over God or price our foods as brands, as symbols of status. Your society has debased food, and as a result, 
Your society is mentally imbalanced. Doctors search for medication to cure illnesses, not realizing that the root of all sickness is from what you eat. You are consumed, a Sanskrit word meaning a wasting disease. Nassau will cure humanity, though. One person at a time, we will raise them up. How, huh? You gonna eat me? Drool sprayed from Tyler's mouth. Is that how you cured Rachel? Kill us and eat us? Then do God's work as we're elevated? Not exactly. As I said, we are to eat organisms of lower consciousness and then raise them to our vibration. Then what did you do to her? Tyler's head throbbed, his vocal cords straining with anger. We saved her. Isaiah walked away and opened the large double windows, flooding the room with fresh garden breeze. I cleaned her, prepared her, bled as much of the infection from her as possible. Then we recycled her back to the mother. He was looking out the window at the fields of fruits and vegetables. Her essence will be brought back up through the roots, and then one day, Naso priests will consume her and unite her with God. Tyler retched, but there was nothing for his stomach to void. His throat stretched again with the same result. Isaiah came back to Tyler and produced a long steel needle from within his coat. Tyler trembled as the cool needle pressed against the skin of his cheek. Tyler did his best to steady his body as the tip was dragged down his face, fell over his jaw, and to his neck. Please. The Maasai people have drank cow's blood for centuries. They developed a unique method of piercing the jugular, yet allowing the animal to live. Please, stop. The man inhaled and pushed. A searing pain bit into Tyler, still unable to move his head. As quick as it happened, the needle was gone, yet the searing pain remained. Isaiah clamped his hand around Tyler's throat, massaging, milking the blood into the basin on the floor. I will cure you too, and you will be elevated. Isaiah looked into his eyes. I promise. <laughs>